Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, thanks for coming in the morning. And uh, today, this week, we're very happy to have Zen Liu from the University of Minnesota. We'll talk about uh, long-lived particles at the LHC. So, uh, Zen. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, thanks, um, Robert, for the invitation and uh, also for the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Um, uh, I will talk about the long-lived uh, particle opportunities at uh, the LHC. I realize that um, I'm the only collider phenomenology talk this for this series so far. So I will give a bit. Uh, I will give a bit of introduction. We really try to set up the picture correctly. Then I will show you, uh, you know, a few attempts we have uh, to tackle the talent uh, uh, of learning particle signatures and realize its uh, full opportunities. Okay. So uh, let's begin the talk. Okay. The basic question: What is learning particle, and why searching for them? So on the right panel, here's the uh, uh, typical uh, uh, lifetime of uh, standard model particles versus their mass, okay? So we can see, of course, they didn't draw photon and the neutrinos here, but their lifetimes are extremely long and uh, some uh, photons are stable uh, from our expectation. But long-lived particles really exist in the standard model, like uh, protons and neutrons, they are rather long-lived. And also there's a bunch of uh, composite particles in the standard model that is long-lived. Uh, and and also, uh, but for our searches for new physics, we often relying on the detection of the stable particles who reconstruct the intermediate uh, unstable particles and discover new physics. For instance, everyone probably will are still vividly remember the discovery of the Higgs boson. We produce the Higgs um, at the production point, it decay instantaneously to a pair of photons and we look for the photons. So in reality, we are detecting photons, stable particle, and trying to reconstruct the Higgs resonance, okay? But uh, what's interesting is standard model itself also provide us a bunch of particles that is metastable, right? Whose lifetime is only out of um, meter level, which means at colliders, I will be able to see uh, them, uh, you know, having some displacement, okay? So that, those are particles with the visible light, uh, light frame displacement are called the long-lived particles, okay? And they, we have them just uh, for various reasons, approximate symmetries, kinematic suppressions, et cetera, okay? But for BSM physics, okay, we often think our target is the heavy new physics uh, who are properly decaying back to us uh, or to the extreme that are very stable, right? But instead, there are many scenarios giving rise to particles whose lifetime fall into the category of being metastable, which means I cannot detect them as missing energy. I cannot detect them as uh, promptly decaying particles to reconstruct uh, uh, them by visible particles, but rather may move a certain distance in my uh, collider detector and uh, then can be cap captured. And uh, for, for this audience, I don't think I need to motivate you too much about uh, such a possibility and the plausibility, such as supersymmetry gave rise to those, and the hidden sector dynamics in the feeble coupling cases often gave rise to lonely particle signatures. Uh, by the way, I've got to mention, please feel free to interrupt and ask questions directly. And then how to search for them, okay? Uh, this is, again, a, a simple picture, right? This transfer point of detector, we collide particles, we, de we detect the decay particle, right? So this is obviously a simple event with a pair of, uh, a, you know, a pair of photons. We, we do uh, the discovery like this, right? However, the learning particle itself give, uh, gave rise to a much more rich possibilities. I produce particles, they can travel a distance, then decay back to detectable standard model particles, okay? In the form of displaced vortices, practice uh, uh, jets, uh, multi-track vortices in the muon spectrometer, et cetera, okay? Uh, but, this, but none of them are standard searches. In fact, none of them are even similar, uh, can be simulated faithfully within our current framework, okay? So it's a really a new experimental challenge. And, the, the LHC detector, we design them for, to look for prompt signals, right? Uh, for, for, for the long-lived signatures, we would encounter several challenges, such as trigger, reconstruction. Uh, uh, trigger means whether we, re we decide to record the event or not, because the LHC provides so much data, right? And uh, it's easy to, uh, to say thermal background for those uh, events are zero, but uh, the, the real question relies in what's the non-standard background? 
So it is this challenge and the lack of understanding and lack of uh, service right now uh, uh, generates lots of uh, interest uh, in the community and to think about uh, such aspect. Yeah, to summarize, one word about why we want to do learning like searches, uh, uh, not only because they are possible, but there's a huge uncharted and well-motivated territories to explore, okay? And uh, there's a huge, this is an important job for us theorists to point out those possibilities and uh, give some, uh, you know, rough planning about how to hunt for them. It's really because the standard BSM program continues and improves, right? We, we, they are doing machine learning, they're doing improve the detector. Theorists probably can only reinterpret the, the, their results or pr propose new new goals, uh, new benchmark models. And it's, it's really new opportunities that relies in learning particles and they shall be pioneeringly explored by us. Okay? And indeed, there's a, a, a veritable renaissance of learning particle signature. Right. Uh, it's not that only we only start talking about learning particle in recent years. People are in especially Susie phenomenon talk about them a long time ago. Okay. But only in recent years, uh, people generate more and more interest. One reason is the again I mentioned earlier, the standard search is going on well. Okay. And people start to think about the, the more opportunities. And there are many, many proposals uh, uh, has been put forward to look for learning particles, such as the Mesusla, Code XB. Alex 3x, a new base, phase or shift, uh, et cetera. Okay. But the basic words is the uh, basic fact is the world is seems to be planning and conducting new experiments searching for those hidden learning particles. And in particular, for today's talk, I would like to concentrate on the, this class of possibilities, which is a centrally produced uh, uh, hard learning particles. Uh, you know, if you map it into the mass plane, it's basically anything about tens of GeV. Because below that, I think uh, there are other facilities to look for them, such as beam dump experiments or forward uh, uh, physics experiments. Okay. Um, so uh, I think uh, some of audience may not be familiar with all those concepts, but I think uh, it's also uh, important uh, for for me to uh, to uh, uh, to give uh, as a brief. Uh, uh, introductions about how to think about the learning particle searches. Okay. And uh, the, uh, this is particularly important uh, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, in, in the rest of my talk, I will uh, point out the big uh, component that has been missed uh, by the large community uh, of, the, uh, of the learning particle opportunities. And I will show you my efforts in realizing this big opportunity. Okay. Just to get some idea, okay? Here's the detector, okay? One of the smaller detectors is, the, is I think this is CMS, okay? A person, uh, this is an image, okay? A person is of this size, right? So you can see the detector itself is six floor tall, okay? We have built such a big all-purpose detector already to, to find, to look for uh, beyond the number of particles. Uh, and uh, uh, if I shrink this big detector to the box, uh, you know, to the size of the box to this left, to the left, okay? Uh, I can put together a bunch of uh, proposals in one plot, okay? So that's the plot, okay? Our horizontal axis is the LC beam. I'm colliding particles here and they're trying to detect them. This, um, uh, this triangle box, uh, I'm sorry, this uh, uh, rectangle is the Atlas CMS big detector. There's a Codex B proposal, Atlas 3X proposal, and the big Masiusa proposal. They are all proposed to be there to look for lonely particles decaying within them, right? <laughs> so if I switch to the transverse plane, you can again see the Atta CMS as a cylindrical detector. They are, their size is still in the intermediate, but there's a huge Masiusa and the smaller Codex V and Alex 3X, okay? So that's the basic uh, uh, setup of various proposals uh, that uh, has been put in there to look for, uh, you know, centrally produced uh, lonely particles, heavy lonely particles. Um, but now let's come back to some basics and just think about why we propose those and what are the advantages. And then they will realize some, uh, uh, some counterintuitive ans answers uh, about opportunity, okay? So let's come back to the basics. And uh, here's a really a typical sketch and the cartoon plot of uh, any learning particle circuits. 
uh, in their results in sensitive peaks. Okay, so horizontal axis is the log scale in a given underlying new physics lifetime. The vertical axis is some upper limit on the cross section or upper limit on the branching fraction of the production mode of the uh, uh, of the new lonely particles. So obviously, the lower the uh, anything above the blue curve are typically excluded. So so anything lower I means the lower the blue curve, the better. Okay. So when I already get an idea, okay, it seems like for any sub search uh, detectors sub detector search for lonely particles, there will be a best operational point for the searches uh, of, of the lifetime of the given lonely particles. And there are two arms, right? The low lifetime arm and the long lifetime arm. And typically, if you put several lonely particle search together, you will get a several of those blue curves. And you see, OK, with a coherent uh, uh, um, uh, search for all those uh, uh, lonely signatures, I will be able to cover all those uh, uh, shaded regions, right? Um, but importantly, you also automatically get an impression that uh, it seems to, uh, uh, to uh, you know, uh, uh, many people that a near detector is there's a given that there's a best uh, sensitivity location, it seems that near detector is better for short lifetime lonely particles, far detector are better for long lifetime uh, um, uh, lonely particles. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, so for a long lifetime, I want a far detector and a large volume. Okay. And this is even backed up by math. Okay, this math is uh, uh, tricking everybody, right? The expectation value of the decay location of the lonely particle d bar with a left frame lifetime d, you know, um, gamma, uh, uh, gamma, beta, gamma, c tau, right? So velocity and the uh, Lorentz boost factor. The average expectation value of the decay location is exactly its left frame lifetime. So you think if I want to look for a lifetime of a particle with lifetime 100 meter, I probably put the detector 100 meter away. So, uh, and, and that's actually convinced many people to think about uh, building far detectors, okay? And uh, here's another view of a typical rich plot. Um, uh, uh, you know, I claim these two ways of presenting results are the major results you will see throughout this talk, right? The horizontal axis here is, a, uh, if I rotate that diagram, it's the mass of the lonely particles. The vertical axis is a, a you know, log scale of the proper lifetime of the lonely particle. Okay, and you know for for proton-proton uh, uh, collisions, the production rate decreases as a high power of polynomials of the single mass, you know, the, the mass of the particle. So it's it's a power law uh, a decrease in the rate, and that determines the edge of the sensitivity. Okay? So so that uh, so far so good, everything makes sense, and uh, it's even consistent with our picture of why do we propose many far detectors. Okay, but uh, let's examine our intuition here. Well, briefly, okay. Let's start with some basic math. Well, the probability for a lonely particle once I produce the IPRC to decay within any sub detector with the inner radius L1 and the outer radius L2 can be described by the following formula, right? So let me assume it's uh, isotropically produced, okay? So basically, the first factor gave me a, a production, uh, sorry, the, uh, gave me the uh, angular acceptance of the detector. Uh, then in the long lifetime limit, I can expand the second term as you know the decay probability within the sub detector and the initial flux when I enter a sub detector with inner radius uh, L1, right? So then it's very clear what drives those this blue curve. Okay, you can see when L1 over D is uh, it's much much bigger than one, right? Which means a small lifetime limit. My initial flux is too small, right? Which means uh, uh, I, the particle already decayed away before entering any any segment of my new detector, right? So, so I have no sensitivity. So as I increase the lifetime, this exponential suppression goes away. So I have exponential gain in our sensitivity, right? Then at some point, when L over D is, uh, is no longer a big suppression, uh, uh, smaller or equal to one, the second term dominance, which is the, the length uh, of the, the any given detector divided by the lifetime, which is the probability for me to decay within any given distance, right? So it's one over uh, C tau dependence, and that's giving me this uh, power law of the sensitivity dropping, okay? And this clearly explains all the curves. Of course, we know smooth transitions and the momentum and boost factor distributions, we can convert everything to make it smooth. 
but even from this formula and this uh, naive understanding, we should already uh, get the idea that it's clear for short lifetime, the closer the detector, the better, okay? We also get the idea for long lifetime, the larger the decay volume, the better. Just to remind you, the alpha CMS radius is five to 10 meter, okay? Well, the biggest uh, in the five detector proposal, Masiusla in the expensive version, luxury version is 20 meter in height, okay? And for any lifetime, it's clear angular coverage, the larger, the better. And there's only one detector have four pi coverage. That is uh, Atlas and CMS, the RC main detectors, which happen to be not in the map of any people people thinking about learning particle circuits. Uh, and that's one of the, uh, the, the, the point I tried to make in this talk. Okay? And uh, just to give you a sense, the typical coverage for the other uh, detector proposals is about 10 to minus two to 10 to minus three smaller than the LC to begin with, okay? Because none of them would have four pi coverage. And also they, typically they are not large uh, either, okay? Uh, good. So now uh, uh, we, we can come to one of the intermediate message I want to make here. And that really drives the rest of the uh, study, okay? So, it seems like the pop, the main detector that we are, have already built will be the most the best place to look for learning particles. Okay, because it has four pi coverage, has large volume, has a, the best approximate the pro, the proximity to the production point, and it's already built. Okay, uh, of of course it has a disadvantage that is not fully shielded, so there will be a lot of uh, standard model uh, prompt uh, background. Okay, and uh, well. Once you realize the main detector itself has one to three orders magnitude advantage in their acceptance alone compared to any other proposals, you, you cannot stop asking yourself why people haven't thought about this or why people haven't uh, uh, been trying hard to work on the main detector's potential on lonely particles. Okay? Um, so before going there, let me just give you, I saw again, two typical logical arrows that a human often, often made, right? You know, although the expectation value of the decay location is, max, is at its uh, lifetime, right? Uh, however, the most probable decay location for any learning particle is at the origin. Okay? Um, this is really because the fractional decay probability for union lines is the same. And, uh, uh, and also you hear this kind of argument saying, once the lonely particle lifetime is very long, we won't be able to detect their decay within the RC. I uh, will admit that a particle lifetime long means the majority of the decay will take outside the RC. However, that, that, that doesn't mean you will be more likely to decay in any other detectors that is far away from the RC, okay? So there's an important inequality here. Not likely to decay in the RC doesn't mean it's more likely to decay in somewhere else, okay? So, in, so the back to the main theme that seems like for every for many arguments, LC should be the best place to look for lonely particles. Main detectors should be the best place to look for lonely particles. So let's rebuild our intuition and and ask why why we haven't done uh, you know lots of effort to look for lonely particles. Okay, let's come back to this cartoon figure schematic figure about sensitivities. We typically see there's LC coverage. And there's a prompt RFC main detector searches, and there's a you know new detector proposal sensitivities. But as I argued earlier, from a geometric acceptance point of view, the RFC itself main detector should be the best, which would really follow this gray curve, you know, outperform anyone else. Okay. And why we haven't seen so? Okay. The reason can be identified as the following. Okay. So we try to form formulate the challenge and identify those. Okay. Uh, Although the main detector at CMS maximize this quantity, okay? They do receive penalties from triggers that I mentioned earlier, and also the background from non-conventional non backgrounds. Okay? The trigger is the long-standing issue that we don't know which, uh, you know, we didn't design the detector to look for lonely particles. However, there's definitely, now it's already the right time to change our trigger menu. In fact, we've already proven that uh, a dedicated trigger typically you have 20 to 50 percent trigger efficiency for new physics uh, signals for learning particles. And also, there's a second question of background suppression. And uh, 
But once we identify the problem, I think it's clear for us that our job, uh, you know, beyond the proposing new detectors is to think about new ways uh, on to improve the sensitivities at the RC by thinking out of the box of traditional searches and traditional triggers and traditional selections uh, to realize there's a huge potential of lonely particles at the RC main detectors and uh, you know, extend the human knowledge territory uh, in the lifetime frontier. Okay. Um, so, so far, that's it for my ba basic uh, setup, but I really hope uh, you are, uh, you're still following me with this at this point that uh, I I'm making this you know, important argument that why main detector is the is the potentially the best place to look for learning particles. Okay. Good. So, uh, so clearly, once you realize that uh, this big potential, and you realize there's a gold mine under the ground, the next job is uh, you know simply let's do uh, gold mining, right? So of course you have to throw the hook uh, to the correct direction and to get this uh, golden nugget. Okay. And um, and this also explains. The next slide also explains, uh, 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 you know, why we have seen many such uh, of uh, many work like this. Okay, because gold mining, the LC, hydrogen LC, uh, or LC main detector, only particles is almost mission impossible. Okay, uh, uh, coming back to the earlier point that uh, the detectors are not designed for only particles, so one has to think about trigger reconstruction, stand background, not in the background. It is mission impossible is because we really do not understand how the downstander background behave. Okay. Even our experimental colleagues are learning them on the go. When they you know collect some of the test data, they understand how things are working. They have to remodel them. Okay. Then and the theorist, we do not ha even have tools to model the complex background. Okay. You may feel LTC is a well-developed field, a PCR, Delphi's, uh, you know, MagGraph, etc. Okay, and none of them are suitable for to conduct such kind of phenol you know, study, right? Because whatever background you try to simulate with those uh, packages, they are they will give you zero, right? Because all the standard model backgrounds are are, are prompt or too light, uh, like BGS, etc. Okay, so uh, you are you are always seems to be in a zero background limit, but you also know that uh, you are not zero background. You have to do a lot of tricks to make it zero background. Come up with new ideas. So, and also our standard on LC phenol is really high nowadays, right? We need to do NLO calculation. Uh, we need to really understand the estimate the background to great details, et cetera, okay? But none of those is suitable for learning particle signatures. That creates a tremendous obstacle for anyone attempts to think about the main detector potential on learning particles. Even a few of us realize that uh, LC could be the best place to look for learning particles, okay? And this also explains why there, you know, again, very few people working on this. But uh, you know, uh, once you think there's a gold mine and you think uh, you don't want to miss new physics, uh, we can try hard. Okay. So the rest of my talk is about a few attempts and ongoing efforts of my and my collaborators on how to realize the RTC opportunity. So the first example I want to give is uh, how to timing uh, uh, timing the RTC opportunity. Okay, um, the idea is the, the following. Okay, uh, it's a work based uh, uh, with your Chicago people, Jaliu and Nantou Wang. Okay, we try to overcome those difficulties by uh, put the time coordinates on the learning. Excuse particles. me. Uh, yeah. Could you give an example, uh, some examples of what you mean by non-standard background, so I can focus on it. Yeah, sure. Uh, so in the rest of the talk, actually, I'll mention uh, a few of them, I'll give you some uh, cartoon, but uh, let me give you a brief uh, idea of what they are, right? So there are the, the learning particle, one of the major signature you have is the displaced vertex, right? But uh, standard model don't give you a big energetic displaced vertex with large opening angles, but, but uh, itself, but there are some other related background, for instance, I can have, a, I can produce a, a energetic neutron that it, it hits my detector material, create uh, some nuclear scattering, give me a secondary vortex. So I'll see a uh, you know, burst of uh, tracks some, with some displacement. Or I have uh, uh, some cosmic ray hitting my detector, create some, some, some shower in my detector. 
And there are even more weird uh, uh, components. And another big class of uh, random background is like many of my search is based upon the, the, the reconstructing the cracks to be displaced. However, there are so many events going on at the RC and I may accidentally connect the energy hits in the wrong way and they will be forming a, you know, Point crack pointing in the wrong direction, looking lo looks like they are they are displaced. So it, it's clear those are none of those are simulable by by current tools, right? And and, and uh, they are they are really non-trivial. And and uh, in this example, I will show you some even more weird backgrounds uh, uh, that one have to think about. Thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, okay. But, but, so, sorry, could I ask yeah. a question on that as well? So the, the yeah. current, maybe you're going to talk about this later if you're going to talk about triggering, yeah. but you mentioned yeah. that the current triggers aren't that good, but they're whatever, 1% efficient or something like this. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Are, are there estimates just based on the number of events that are currently being seen, like rough estimates of what the background counts are going to be? If you assume that all of the events you're seeing are background and not, you know, new physics. Um, um, yes, they are. Uh, so, so I'm oversimplifying the situation. In fact, uh, uh, you know, I, in the beginning part of my talk, I did show you there are many, big, uh, many different kinds of searches, right? So, uh, for instance, if I try to look for uh, um, uh, uh, the Higgs boson decaying to a pair of Lonely particles, okay, which is not a very energetic event, the typical trigger efficiency of about percent. If I only look for one displaced vortex uh, 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 in the, maybe in the muon uh, uh, in in the in the in the um, all right in the tracking system, the background is single digits. So once I'm able to construct the vortex that I'm sure is displaced, I will have a really high background rejection, and that's a single digit. However, if I'm not able to reconstruct the vortex. For instance, the particle travels so long that going to the muon spectrometer, I don't have good vortexing there. The background is about, uh, you know, if I scale up, it's about the 10,000 at the, the high lumi RC. Okay. Uh, so the question is really depend on which sub detector you are looking into and what kind of handles you have on them. Uh, so sorry, 10,000. These are numbers per year that you're quoting. Uh, no, uh, with the full uh, uh, luminosity, like uh, swimming. Oh, the full data. Uh, I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so the, in detail, the, I did a huge table on one can draw and uh, show you different search and different strategy, different trigger plans. You have to, some trigger plans have, some plans have good trigger efficiency by high background. Some plans have low trigger efficiency by low background. So it's a, uh, uh, it's a huge, uh, uh, you know, complex field. However, the generically, I'm saying we are not optimizing on the potential and there's a lot of room to improve. Good. So, so, so to overcome those difficulties, this uh, that I, I briefly give you, a, you know, a concept. And thanks to all those uh, good questions, is uh, we are trying to use timing. Okay, well, okay, timing is never useful for any for the traditional searches for uh, standard model particles. Why? Because let's imagine I produce a Higgs and decay to a pair of photons. Okay, so my signal photon will travel like this directly to my detector. And as you know, following speed of light and my background uh, photon will travel the same way. So they would arrive if they're pointing to the same location, they will arri arrive at the same time. There's no separation, okay? But hence, uh, you know, just look for any heavy particles. I, you know, at the timing providing no separation power, okay? However, we realize that once you start thinking about lonely particles, okay? Whose search have been mainly based upon the displacements, uh, a displaced vertex, the timing coordinates could provide a huge amount of background suppression and also, uh, you know, uh, for both trigger and the analysis. Okay, the idea is like the following. Let me say I, I collide the proton protons, I pro pro produce a lonely particle, it travels a certain distance and decay back to standard model particle. If, if I put a clock here, right, I have to see that the amount of time caused this particle A to arrive at any location that I, where I can record a time will be the mother particle divided by velocity plus daughter particles travel distance divided by velocity. Well, any standard model background which will travel directly to this location will follow this line, okay? Uh, obviously, any heavy particle like tens of GeV, they are not traveling at the speed of light. So if you convert the, our timing resolution to 
uh, you know, our sensitivity to, in principle, what, what's the uh, a maximal beta we are sensitive to, okay? Uh, even that means even 1% delay in principle can be spotted my, with my detector because I have uh, such a good uh, timing resolution for my detector, at least, at least in the future upgrade, okay? So this means, uh, well, timing is never useful for any prompt uh, particle searches. Timing can be extremely useful for uh, new physics searches in lonely particles whose time delay is really dominated by first, the slowness of the mother particle, okay? And even if they are 99% the speed of light, they are still slow compared to given, the, given the, how, the precise clock I have. And also the longer distance they travel, right? So you, we all know the triangular inequality here. So it's obviously will be delayed, okay? Uh, so once you put a clock, you will be able to separate otherwise inseparable signal and background because uh, 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 so, so we propose as in general to look into the time coordinates of all the events and to pick the lonely particle signature, okay? So, but of course now let me show you what's the background, okay? The background, the, uh, uh, I mean, is from our study, the major background coming from two sources, okay? One is, what do you, you know, although I say my signal is delayed, uh, however, when I detect a standard model process, I don't have a perfect timing, right? I still have resolution. So the resolution effects gave me a 30 picosecond spread of my recording of the events, right? And the other, on the other hand, even more non-trivial physics effect, which people may, may not be aware, when we co collide the protons to proton, okay, we're not colliding one on one. Okay, in fact, we are collecting 10 to the 11 protons on another bunch of 10 to 11 protons. because their price actually is small and we don't compress them that much. So we're co colliding two blobs of protons. So in essence, a collision takes place, when a collision taking place, they may take place here or may take place here. And, they, and even at the same location, they have, have time separation because the blob has geometric size. The, the RMS spread of these two blobs within one collision is about 190 picoseconds, which means uh, even I don't uh, even the the the, uh, uh, the there's an uh, 190 picosecond spread for my background from collisions if they are uh, if I uh, misclassify the events to be coming from the same order. Okay, so one really have to estimate all those backgrounds. Okay, and there's additional backgrounds. I've already, uh, you know, answered that was, uh, uh, mentioned that was earlier a bit. Interaction with the material, cosmic rays, and there's other things that people have not, are not aware, beam halo, okay? The protons are a collection of charges. They have uh, fields, and there's a halo and the activity to energy depositions. There are satellite bunches, which are the empty, semi-empty bunches for acceleration purposes and passing by each other, et cetera, okay? None of this uh, at theorists are aware, but we really have to dig into the pile of documents to have some reasonable estimate, okay? But however, the idea is so simple, okay? Just to give you, an idea, uh, give you an example of how big the separation one can have for uh, any typical lonely particle signal. This is our beloved um, Higginos, right? Let me say I pair produce uh, Higginos. They in a GMSB, they decay to gravitino plus you know, a pair of fermions. The lifetime is typically long if the Susie breaking scale is high. Um, for 200 GeV uh, 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 Higgs Zeno, which are not that heavy, right? Uh, IRC is 14 TeV, they have a lot of boost. But the, the 200 GeV Higgs Zeno already gave you, this is a typical delay of the signal, okay? Already have more than 95% of them delayed by more than one nanosecond compared to the standard model background, which are made by two components I mentioned earlier the resolution of the same vortex collision with 30 picosecond spread and the, the power up collisions with 190 picosecond spread, okay? If I put the cloud here, I will clearly pick up those signals as a pure sample, okay? I don't have many standard model background. And uh, but one also have to realize this and show this, okay? If it's one TeV, they are even more delayed. So they, the, you know, all, almost all of them are, you know, following this solid blue curve, they are delayed by more, more than one nanosecond. In fact, they are so delayed, they are even entering the next bunch of beam colliding each other. So I have to block out some windows and trying to pick up those signals, okay? But once you point out this great, this important idea and concept of uh, 
that is uniquely possible for lonely particles. So people can conduct the search. Just to ask at, at this point, um, so 30 yeah. picoseconds was the upgrade. What's the timing capabilities at the moment? The timing capabilities of ECOR is about is 200 picoseconds. Okay. okay. So, so the, this the dash line is a 190 picosecond uh, 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 beam, beam uh, spread, um, but there's a resolution counter resolution is something like this. So mm -hmm. you can you can draw it like the following, but they, they are not uh, you know really exceeding to uh, to the high uh, time delays. Okay. okay. But for these kind of models, it might but, still uh, be. Is this so? For these kind of models, could you do something with the current data? Where uh, the that's exactly the point. Yeah, good okay. point. Okay. So next slide. Okay. okay thanks. So, yeah, the idea I think is so simple, um, but of course it's so paranoid because the experimentalists don't know how the background composition either. So they actually conduct a search within one year of our proposal. Okay, so here's our understanding back then about lonely particles, like gluino decaying to gluon plus uh, gravitino. Right, uh, so we cover mass versus lifetime, bump searches, displaced the water searches, and highly stable charged particle searches. Okay. But once you make use of a time delay at a certain TV, this is the new CMS search, they are limits is by this right curve. You can see that there's a big jump in both the in both the mass, which again is non-trivial. Okay. Of course, we double the energy, so there's a big jump coming from there, but also uh, we do improve our sensitivity by quite a bit to realize such a jump, but also in lifetime, right? So we can see we improve the lifetime coverage on the higher end by several others magnitude, which is a huge improvement that you don't see nowadays at the RC. So you can see uh, we did, uh, uh, we are very excited when we saw this result because, um, uh, and this is a very minimal search. They only require 300 GB missing ET to trigger. So they didn't make a full use of data. I don't have a new delayed trigger. But even with that, requiring a minimal tracklist jet with three nanosecond delay, you will be able to find no background, only one background actually, and uh, put six uh, such a great uh, limits. Okay, and I also have to uh, tell you the traditional search for this place of vortex, of course, also improve once I double the energy. So that's the blue lines are current search of uh, the certain TV results. But you still see this several other magnitude the improvements in lifetime, and also the mass improvements also are very significant. So so it. With 200 picoseconds, it's already, our concepts has already been validated and uh, convert to real physics results, okay? And, uh, uh, and uh, not only that, this new search actually gave us so much insight what's about what's going on, okay? So here's a typical just time versus, uh, you know, the differential distribution. And you can see the standard model background is this uh, yellow curve, right? You have the signals that, as I mentioned earlier, they have a big spread, okay, for uh, for typical uh, decay. This is in linear scale, the other plot is in logarithmic scale, okay? So you have a huge amount of them in this long tail if you, you, if you normalize them to unity, okay? And you see it now through your background, like a beam halo, no one, no theorist will be able to estimate, okay? Core and the standard bunches, uh, yeah, most of us don't know what it is, but it's really just the, some bunches that are there with some proton content passing by each other every five nanoseconds to uh, for the acceleration purposes. Okay, and the cosmics. Okay, they only made up about one event in total. Okay, so for the first time we we show that the, the, all those backgrounds are small. Okay, and the search hasn't even optimized on surprising them because there's no need to surprise them any further. Okay. So the experimentalists know how to further surprise them if there's a need. And there's a lot of theory and experimental activities trying to extend our ideas and to realize this uh, uh, timing of, uh, uh, of learning signatures uh, in all subsystems of the uh, 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 RC. Okay. So I think uh, this is a very exciting result. And uh, we really learned a lot, something new that uh, you know, people haven't looked into before. Okay, you can even not even find those in the technical reports. Um, and again, just want to emphasize, uh, not only the parity produced a suey particle can, can be delayed, but even the resonant decay into lonely particles can be delayed. The reason we put this benchmark, he's decaying to a pair of lonely particles, uh, you know, here's in the neutral nitronism uh, uh, typical diagram, but really he's decaying to a pair of lonely particles. 
The reason we put this benchmark forward is right trying to show you retinal decay has a typical boost associated with that, right? Even if it's boosted, right? For instance, uh, Higgs decaying to a pair of 10 GeV particles, where the gamma factor is about six, right? Uh, about uh, half of the event can be delayed. If it's uh, decaying to a heavy alone particle, 50 GeV, again, more than 95% of the alone particles is severely delayed. So making use of this idea of uh, 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 delays for even for those uh, light learning particles, one can potentially improve the, the current best projection of LC sensitivities by another two orders of magnitude uh, for, this, uh, for this kind of circuits. Okay. So, so far, uh, that's all about uh, this uh, one endeavor about proposing this normal observables a novel concept of using timing, okay, which is not useful at all for prompt BSM circuits. Okay, but I actually lied a little bit here. I oversimplified the picture. Okay, uh, the current work I'm I'm doing right now is trying to define the time of the day. Okay, people may have a question mark raised in their mind. What are you talking about? What's the, what? Uh, what's the time of the day? Okay, let's uh, uh, take a look. Okay, let's ask what is the time of the day. That is important because at the previous searches, when I think about the heavy lonely particles decaying hydronically, I separate them based upon the time. So I have to define the time of a jet, right? However, you should realize that the time of a jet has never been defined, okay? Instead, we only know, you know, the time coordinates of a component of a jet, right? So I have a bunch of, uh, you know, parton uh, splitting and hydronization, collect a bunch of energies. Of course, I can define the, the time coordinates of each energy hits in my detector. But what's the time of a jet, right? Let's recall the activity of jet definition, right? Jet is a collection of its components who have a spatial spread and the momentum spread uh, and time spread as well, okay? There's a huge debate in the past, uh, you know, a deep development in the past uh, 10, 20 years about the, what's the proper definition of jet and what's the best clustering algorithm uh, maintains IR, uh, um, IR safety and also calculability. Okay. So, you, so you have just, just, to, yeah. just to ask here, yeah. what's roughly, what is the rough kind of time spread magnitude I should have in mind? Like how many picoseconds are these things spread apart? Roughly? Yeah, so I will give a uh, uh, slides. slice. It's not picosecond at all. Oh, okay, it's fine, it's yeah. nanosecond if you are using some naive jet timing definition. But if you come okay, up with the thanks. correct one, you can reduce that to like tens of picoseconds, okay? Uh, and that's also a very geometric dependent question, okay? I will, I will show you, okay? So it's a, it's a new concept because the timing stemmed from our initial thinking about we should define a time for a jet, okay? The jet is a collection of components. Let's uh, use some uh, classical algorithm, let's say anti-KT, okay? So once I define a jet, as a collection of uh, objects, uh, of course, I can define a bunch of jet uh, properties. We immediately know the momentum of a jet and even the mass of a jet. Okay, the moment the jet is the summation, four momentum is the summation of the components, right? And uh, the three momentum is weighted uh, is the sum of three momentum, and the mass of the jet. It's a pseudo concept. It's just uh, a characterizing the geometric spread of the momentum uh, for the prompt object. Okay. Uh, so it's a vector sum of all components, and its direction is uh, defined, uh, you know, by weighting our momentum. Right? It does not equal equal to this uh, simple summation or average of location. Okay? So direction is already uh, defined in a generated way uh, from their um, from their momentum direction. Okay? So they are used interchangeably. By our our will later, we don't want the time to be like this because time of a jet. Uh, okay, the, the question is now what about time? Especially we want to define time in a way that is not a degenerate with all the other jet information because we are going to measure time of the component and we are going to collect them in a, in a, in a way that is linearly independent from others so that I can use that as an observable to separate the signal and background, right? And obviously you don't want to do the similar practice of defining jet mass. If you define a jet time this way, you are making something non-reasonable because each component are driving at the speed of 
uh, of a uh, uh, speed of light, right? And you think uh, as a collection, even though the jet no pick up the mass, the collection they are still travel speed of light in the, uh, uh, overall. But you cannot say you have peak of mass which is much slower than what they should be. Okay, so it's meaningless to define jet time using this Lorentz uh, as a Lorentz invariance of this weighted uh, coordinates. Okay, um, good. So it's a very uh, a conceptual problem. So it's an interesting theory question. Okay, uh, that we haven't defined this quantity. And it's also experimental question, right? So theoretically, we have many choices, okay? We can define the jet time as the median jet time, once I define a jet, part is component time or a random component. They, they pick up different behaviors of the jet. I can have a null jet direction uh, time, that which means uh, uh, I just uh, um, define the jet time as uh, you know, the, the distance they travel to reach the detector in a straight line following the major direction I defined earlier uh, uh, in you know, x, x, uh, the vector of x. There can be a kinetic, uh, uh, kinematic definition and also PD weighted, and even a generalized definition of jet time by, by different power of weighting of uh, geometric separation. Okay? But this is important in the sense that you know, our power in separating signal and background is relying on this cut, right? Obviously, if my background here, major background is this uh, uh, collision, hard collision from this yellow color. If my major background uh, definition is much narrower, I will be able to make a much better signal collection. I even put the limit, the fittings opportunities to look for lighter and more boosted uh, learning particles, right? So uh, let's see what's going on, okay? So we experimented a bunch of different definitions, okay? Uh, here's a typical spread for a prompt object, how they would uh, spread over uh, the, 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 um, um, the, 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 the time, okay? So here the reference time is really just uh, assuming a particle traveling as a straight line to the jet uh, direction, okay? So the, order, the units here is roughly a few nanoseconds, I say three nanoseconds. So like, uh, uh, so here for a simple object, the typical spread, if you use uh, some uh, random component or the median is about a uh, few hundreds of picoseconds. For a semi-forward object, out of 1.5 to 2, is also central traditional defined as. The spread is much more, much larger, right? You can see the spread uh, can be as large as a uh, nanosecond for a random direct uh, def definition. And the, clearly, there's an optimal definition here. That is the most narrow one defined by this blue curve. This is the PT weighted uh, uh, jet time uh, 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 that has the best uh, convergence. And uh, hence, it's a quasi optimal uh, experimental definition of jet time. It turns out this definition is also an IR safe quantity, but also calculable quality. And it even have the same weight as how we define jet direction. So it's a really nice way to define a jet. But just to give you a reference, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the experimental search obviously have a much larger spread than what I would anticipate with the proper definition. The reason is they were using the median jet time to, to, to define the time of this object. But I've already advocated to them to use the PT weighted one that from our current search. If they do so, they will uh, gain another factor of uh, five to 10 in signal background separation easily. Okay. Just to ask, yeah. are these plots from simulated or real data? Well, those plots are from simulated. And this simulation is uh, uh, reflecting reality in the sense that uh, our object is, uh, again, is a hard uh, uh, object, uh, you know, 50 GeV PT. So it's, uh, and, we can, and we also applied the uh, pile up and the uh, jet creaming algorithm. So those soft pollutants are, are already been probably removed uh, using, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, proper simulation. And the, the spread is really caused by the, uh, the spatial distribution of the jet components. Okay. And of course, the uh, experimentalists can verify this, but, uh, but they, I, I think they are doing this right now. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. so uh, we, we are not satisfied here, right? right? This is only the best definition for prompt objects, okay? We also have to check how things behave for lonely particles. So we can check, is, then it depends on many different uh, uh, um, uh, concepts uh, or quantities, such as a mother particle momentum direction, father particle momentum direction, decay location, etc. So you can see 
uh, uh, for for simple mother forward the daughter, the spread is huge, and the PD ready has the obviously one should use that. And for other definitions, uh, those def, uh, uh, for other uh, um, uh, uh, configurations, uh, and the, the the difference between different definitions are not that huge. Okay, so but nevertheless, PD ready is still the most narrow one. Okay, it shows the robustness, but also tells you the the dependence on this. Uh, um, uh, of uh, of the relative time spread depending on your definition or oh, down the geometry. Okay. So just to ask, the you, signal spread differently. Yeah. Is there some theoretical understanding of why this one is so much better than the others? Uh, um, uh, yes, uh, yes, um, there. Are, yes and no. Okay, I didn't derive an okay. analytical formula to calculate the, the expect, uh, expected the spread. Uh, uh, you know, from a data distribution. However, uh, you know, uh, uh, we do have semi analytic uh, uh, understandings. Uh, maybe there's, uh, for instance, okay. Uh, so this is the typical, uh, the median time spread for a flowered object. The, the solid curve is the theoretical, uh, uh, you know, boundaries of the typical spread. So you can see the median time, once I move away for prompt object from the, from the simple one, they do uh, spread, uh, 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 having larger spread. Well, for the, for the PD weighted time, uh, we actually, uh, it's much smaller. You see the coordinates is um, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and theoretically we can derive the upper boundary to be like uh, this dashed line. So we, we have some asymmetrical control. Uh, argument wise, it's e also easy to understand. Uh, time, as the coordinates of, of one over energy, right? So if I weigh them by energy, uh, and, uh, I, in some sense, I give them a more flight prior because I don't want the time, the time definition of an object dominated by its soft components either, right? All these soft components are, are, have much larger time for many reasons. Uh, so the, the purpose of down weighting them and also have the flight prior in the, you know, in the uh, uh, energy, uh, uh, in the modules of energy, Give us the, the reasoning for think about PD weighted this uh, as reasonable one. Mm -hmm. However, I also have to admit it's a sl still a little bit mysterious to us why linear power is the best. We actually secretly have tried uh, other powers, fraction powers, 1.5, 2, 3, etc. And we know which they will converge to in some large, uh, large power limit. But I suspect the best uh, weighting is some alpha equals 1.1, 1.2, but we, we didn't really uh, try to optimize on this, given that they have so much other dependence. Yeah, that was sort of the follow-up question. I mean, this yeah. you've, you've, you've tested this particular set. Can you say yeah. whether or not you expect there should be other things which are even better? But I thought you, uh, uh, yeah, I guess so, you just answered that. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's why we, we tried those different powers. and. And also a combined power of PD versus the angular separation, you know, the uh, delta R between the components. But this one really works. Uh, uh, what's the uh, the best? I would call it the quasi optimal because we decided to stop our exploration from putting different power here on this delta R because this delta R makes too much information knowledge about the momentum direction. So I do want to keep this observable as independent as possible from other information. So in essence, we mainly focus on fringing alpha and the one seem to be really awesome, okay? I, I do not claim it's the best, okay? And, uh, but uh, you know, but it's already show you like order one of the magnitude improvement in some sense compared to other definitions. Okay. Good. So of course, to, we do want to emphasize it has a lot of different dependence on several quantities, like the, the, the direction of the daughter particle mother particle, the direction of the daughter particle, and their decay location, where the mother particle is decayed. So the spread has very big distribution. We saw that in the, in the paper, which I haven't published, but it's coming up. Uh, but clearly, the blue curve is the PD weighted. It's always, almost always the most narrow, okay? So, so I think it's, again, tells you the robustness of such definition. And at least we, before we come as, up with any better uh, uh, definition of jet time, we should use this one. Uh, and I think that will already improve a lot of the current uh, 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 status of the RC circuits. Okay, so um, yeah, it seems I'm I'm running off out of time. We start a little bit late, Robert. How much time I have? Oh yeah, I mean, feel feel free to take take another sort of five ten minutes, no problem. Okay, okay. 
So good. So so I asked a very we asked a very question about what jet time, but it's also a very practical question, and I, we believe we give some quasi optimal answers uh, here. So we are very excited to to see things are yeah uh, you know be improved and then converted to real search. Um, okay. So then uh, we are not satisfied. Okay. So so beyond time, are there more handles for learning? Particle opportunities. Okay, uh, we we'll continue on this journey of mission possible. But uh, for the sake of time, I'm I'm skipping this. It's really just just give you one idea. Uh, instead of viewing the calorimetry as a perfect absorber of energy, we want to look for substructures within calorimetry. Okay, so the jet lonely particles do give me ability to reconstruct displaced vortex in those, which has now not been thought before. So we point out this possibility and show you it does improve the sensitivity for learning particles again, potentially by one to two orders magnitude. And this is really by doing, uh, looking for this place what has in a place where people never try to, okay? And uh, uh, by combining the time and the spatial coordinates into a 4D this place what has reconstructed. Okay? But I, I wouldn't go to more details here. Uh, but instead, uh, let me give you, um, in the last five minutes I have, let me give you, uh, you know, another mission impossible thing, I'm almost a fault of the airplane, okay? So looking for soft learning particles, okay? And many of you, I, the audience have done SUSI searches at right, some point in their career, right? So we all know SUSI stop is one of the primary targets for TV scale SUSI and for many arguments uh, of, uh, you know, Higgs mass or nitrogenase, et cetera, okay? So, but let's you know step back a little bit. Think about what's the current status of uh, stocks. There it is. Okay, it seems like uh, Susie stuff are fully covered as a function of lifetime. Was uh, sorry, mass versus lifetime. We covered the long lifetime, media lifetime, and promptly. Right. So we do a full lifetime coverage uh, for a stop of 500 GeV or, or below. Right. So and we are continuing to improve all those uh, knowledge. But the question is. What about this infamous compressed SUSI? We know once we compress it, we can hide it, right? And uh, what me and my collaborator realized that not only is that, okay, it's a particular interest for us to con consider compressor stop, okay? For instance, we also sometimes for want to the, for our priority uh, conserving SUSI, we want the dark matter candidate to be there, right? And uh, from direct detection, we often, you know, without too much uh, sing and dance, right? We do want the Bino to be the RSP and be the dark matter. However, it's overclose the universe. We often require a, a coroner later for hundreds of GEV Bino RSP to be a viable dark matter candidate. So in fact, if you take into the bound state effect and uh, uh, various uh, uh, summer field enhancements, you will be able to derive, I prefer a mass splitting about 30, 20 to 30, 40 GeV for stop Bino coordination scenario to take place. And what this regime? This is the regime roughly here, okay? In this plot, which we haven't searched, I don't know, which we searched for, but we don't have coverage because we really don't have much to see. It's compressed uh, and uh, we are only looking for mono jets, maybe sometimes plus a soft beat, okay? So we then realizing this, we, we first uh, ask, can we do a mono jet plus soft displaced track search? Because we realize the truly stop will be long lived if in this, in this region, okay? Uh, the, but immediately the question we are going to you know, think this is impossible because we are going to swamp by soft standard model background. And we dare not to say we can simulate the background and tell our experimental friend to do so, okay? Uh, and of course we did this lifetime calculation to make sure our calculation is robust in the use three flavor conserving one without this uh, T2 uh, stop to C and uh, uh, term and Bino transition, it's really long lived, typical lifetime Coming from millimeter to like uh, to meter level, okay, um, like like the following. We also calculate the vortex fraction from the you know operator mixing to make sure our lifetime calculation is robust. Okay, uh, but uh, what do we do? Okay, the signal seems to be impossible. You cannot convince anyone to conduct such a search. Uh, so what we decided, uh, uh, you know, uh, as a special agent, we decided to look into the open data. CMS open their data, put them on public re uh, reservoir for people to download and play with, okay? So we thought, okay, sure, we want to play with it. 
I think the open data is as clean as our platform level events. Maybe we will see a you know a photon, an electron, a, you know things like that. Okay, but that's not the case. Okay, it's a huge endeavor for us. It took us several years. Okay, uh, uh, first thing you realize is not is nothing like this. But instead, what they provide us is something like this. Huge number of uh, information in that. It's very raw. Okay, it's a Python bias in total. You have to look for any, any subset, and even that, they are not immediately interpretable as particles. Okay, for instance. Uh, one of the key parameters for anyone attempts to look for long-lived signatures is to uh, look for displacement in a transverse direction, okay? Uh, standard model should give you zero, okay? Standard model should be like this, okay? But data give us this. It looks like all standard model particle data they collected are already displaced from the origin, okay? Uh, what's happening? Okay, so because they didn't even apply a beam spot correction to those raw data, they we have to dig into the document to understand uh, there's the this the location between the center of the beam spot and the center of their coordinate system to realize there's the, there's a fake displacement in the data, and there are many things we have to do to validate our assumption, look for those uh, ideas. In the end, okay, we show we we understand the data and the open the data box and apply our selection cuts for both signal and background. Uh, we have to do a lot of modeling of how things behave. But in the end, after this whole complex process of uh, modeling, reasoning, opening data, validation, et cetera, we are able to derive new, new limits, okay? This is a series of divided, uh, derived the new BSM limits from LHC real data, okay? And I, I, I think uh, we do make some progress in tackling this mission impossible to look for things that are supposed to be, you know, hard to model and um, thrown to the background, okay? So here's our results, okay? Well, this line is the line for the uh, stop Bino correlation. Above this line, I will overclose the universe, okay? Uh, below this line, I would have and, and they're abandoned. Uh, so, but this roughly give you an idea where we are looking for. The red curve is what the new limit we derive. This is where the result to come out. Okay. The existing prompt search only covers this region. The existing disparing track and the heavy stable target particle search covers this region. So we really derive the new limits in this well motivated regime for, with our serious efforts. Okay, with huge amount of work, but we we hope we demonstrate it is indeed possible to look for monogenic plus soft displacer tracks. And uh, in the future, experimenters can do take over and do the you know such important search for those uh, seemingly challenging and impossible uh, uh, channels, okay? So I'm running out of time. I'm now going to talk about uh, this uh, singly produced uh, soft uh, uh, hydronic lonely particle circuits of heavy axions and heavy neutrinos. But let me summarize here, okay? So I think, I hope the, the message has been conveyed here, okay? So up, there are big opportunities exist in new lonely particle circuits at LHC. I would focus on new, okay? We do want to uh, explore the unexplored territories, okay? And uh, the reason we think it's huge is really because the main detector is one of the most competitive place because it's an all-purpose detector, four pi coverage, large volume, and it's already there, okay? And uh, of course, it's a huge challenge for anyone to carry out such a search, but I believe our efforts has been already fruitfully converted to real experimental results. Uh, in many different ways. So although the final proposals are almost mission impossible, I did show you a bunch of new ideas me and my collaborator have been working on about timing, 4D reconstructing the colorimetry, correlation with open data, and also you know some idea for that I skipped about the high quality axions and uh, low mass uh, hydronic lonely particles. I will stop here, thank you. Okay, uh, well, thank you very much. Um, let's stop the recording there.